All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is October 23rd, 2023, and we're going to have some fun tonight. We're just going to keep digging into the scriptures. We're going to see another difference within the Gospels. We're going to see the, the wording that's connected within it. We're going to discover what the words mean and where they lead us to from other parts of the Gospels to the Old Testament and Daniel to the book of Revelation, showing the differences in these groups. And then we're going to continue through other parts of the New Testament and other books in the epistles, and we're going to show where these connections are. Because as always, we know there's a pre, there's a mid, there's a post. It's a Luke, it's a Mark, it's a Matthew. But it's not just pre, mid, and post. We also know from Luke 12 that there's three worker groups. One group pre-trib takes the bride is taken, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, the, the pre-trib goes to the third heaven. As Enoch never experiences death, they were diligent, they loved the Lord, they had faith, and he's rewarding them. We've understood this for a long time, but we know from that group, a group remains. We know they're the group that we talk about in Luke 24. They're the Smyrna group. They're the, the ones called the little flock out of all the sheep. They're the little flock within the sheepfold. And we're going to talk about this. We know that there's there's differences within the wheat. We're going to see all of these connections. We know then at the end of seals, you got the 144,000 that worked the seven years of trumpets after the first group works the seven years of seals. And then, of course, we got that third worker group that is here during the millennial reign. All these things we're, we know, but we're going to add more detail. And that's what this is about. This revelation is the revelation of the open books. It's the mystery being revealed of the end of days over the past six years. And what are we going to do in the time that we have left, I believe, till true Pentecost, a uh, true Feast of Weeks next year? Well, we're going to keep digging. We're going to keep searching. We're going to keep strengthening. We're going to keep spreading the love and doing what we can. And having said that, yeah, you'll notice I'm a little bit longer by a day than my usual videos in between. I didn't do a short yesterday. I didn't do a video. I didn't do anything video-wise yesterday. Because, you know, sometimes it just gets weary. You know, sometimes it feels heavy. Sometimes you just get weary. Well, I'll tell you what. Getting weary, brothers and sisters, is a great sign of our dear sister typology of Leah. Right? Her name means weary, just like the Gentile bride. And so the last couple days... Uh, you know, it just kind of, again, it just, <laughs> it wears on you and it wears on you. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And, you know, Google, uh, uh, YouTube has analytics. And so I'm putting out, you know, shorts every day. I've got like 50 something shorts now. I think I'm at 54 shorts and there's analytics on all these things, right? So I can see how many views, how long people watch, what's the average, who, how many percentages watch to the end. And I'll tell you what, I don't look at the analytics very often because it's just depressing. You know, you're doing something like this. You're believing that thousands of people, at least a couple thousand people are really grasping it. They've been following it for a while. And then I go to my analytics and it all starts to make sense. You know, out of all the videos, from videos that got 4,000 to, to videos, look at that, ever since, ever since we started looking to next year, we went from 4,000 to about 2,000, even a little under for a while. Why? Because everybody just wants the date. And it's kind of, and that's why I say it's weary at times, especially <laughs> the reminder when I look at analytics, which is why I don't do it often, because you realize most people aren't really seeking the revelation. They're not really looking for what's truly being revealed here. And it is the revelation of the is to come of Jesus Christ that reveals to us the is with greater clarity and the was with greater clarity. And that's what we're going to keep doing. And, um, you know, you're, you're seeing the videos and maybe from 4,000 to 2,000 and 25 percent watch all videos to the end. And out of those 2,000, there's only about, I think it's about 70% are subscribed. Do you want to know what's crazier? I was feeling 
confident in knowing, and I know, I'm going to show you guys, I know that I'm supposed to be doing the shorts, all right? Whether the Lord is really using it for now or whether it's going to become more important as the time gets closer and even as it, it starts to begin. And I'm going to show you why. But, <clears throat> excuse me, I went to go look at my shorts analytics as well. <laughs> guys, do you know? My shorts, I jam pack so much into one minute. Like I, I, they're all virtually like just under one minute. Do you know what the average view time is on my shorts? Thirty seconds. It's you think I've been pulling out my hair. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was before I felt like pulling out my hair. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. It's what are you listening to in thirty seconds? There's no way you're going to grasp it in 30 seconds when I've packed so much to complete the story within one minute. So, of course, that wearied me as well. And again, that's why I got to keep away from analytics. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Just as a little side note that that came to my attention. Watch this. In uh, Habakkuk. Do you guys remember the story of Habakkuk? I shared this with... Um, our brother Roy, and I think uh, Mark as well. I want to show you something pretty cool. We've talked about this whole thing, um, you know, that was revealed to us and, and this stuff going on with teacher of righteousness and all of these things, and that there was a connection to Habakkuk chapter two. We talked about it a long time ago. Newer people, you, you won't remember uh, this Habakkuk two stuff. But I want to show you something within it. And what had happened is I had been doing shorts already and i came to see this to to read through habakkuk again and i decided to go look into the definitions of the words a little more closely but i had already started for about two weeks uh doing the shorts and then i came across this which we know is also connected to the teacher of righteousness okay who were, who will make known the revelation of the prophets listen to this in habakkuk 2 2 and the lord answered and uh answered me and said Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Okay? For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end, this is literally the end of days, it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Well, I decided I would look into these words a little bit more closely. Look at this word, right. Okay? It means to write, to engrave. Look at what it also means. To record. So the Lord answers. Remember, it's talking about a time at the end of days when these prophecies, these visions that the prophets have had will be made known. And for those who are going quickly about things, whether the running, them that run may read it, whether it's because they just need to see something quickly because it's the end of day starting, or whether it's shortly before that and people are just busy in the end of days. And now there's these things that people are flicking through. They can't even watch one minute, let alone the three hour full length teachings. Well, listen to what it says. And the Lord answered me and said, write or record. What am I doing right here? This is recording. Record the vision. What's the vision? The revelation. Okay? Not a dream. Not the vision per se, but it could also mean revelation. So record the revelation, which is what? The revelation being made plain on tables. That was the revelation of the understanding from the prophets being revealed for the end of days. So the Lord answered me and said, Record the revelation and make it plain upon tables. Check this out. A tablet. How many people right now are watching on tablets? Are watching on little devices in their hands? Isn't that wild? This is about the teacher of righteousness on things that we know is connected to the teacher of righteousness. I had no idea after having already been doing it for two weeks, and I, I went and read some more stuff on it. Record the revelation and make it plain on tablets that he may run that readeth it. So what's another word for run? See, the, the one that's running away or running through, or in our day and age, 
who's quickly going about things. Like being able to watch short videos. I thought that was pretty cool. So that was just a little side note and and I, an understanding that I believe I am absolutely to be doing shorts and I'm not supposed to be paying attention to these analytics. <laughs> so with that, you know, I guess another thing that was wearying me a little bit is a couple of days ago or so, my wife, she didn't want me to go upstairs. She has a, her area where she does crafts and she makes beautiful cards. And uh, she's like, don't come up. I'm making your card. And I was like, making my card? Oh, it's that time of year again. For those that may not know or know, my birthday is November 3rd. And can you believe it? Look at this guy, 51? No. Okay, maybe some of you will say yes, but <laughs> it's it's that mentality, right? In your brain, you're still like, what, 30-ish, 32, somewhere in there? But yeah, 51 years old. And, and so that wearying, you know, of yet another year. But I believe we've got it now. We've understood. We know where we're at. And we're not looking at uh, another two, five, seven, ten years. We've understood, I believe, where it's at. And uh, Jeremiah and so many other pieces of scripture have have been able to confirm these things and make it so clear for us. You know, that's the that's the one thing that's the hardest in the ministry, isn't it? Is in any prophetic ministry, like a prophecy uh, uh, um, ministry, is not prophetic, but prophecy revealing the revelation is the year you know and for many it's it's the seasons the winds that these are going to happen that's no longer the mystery for us this is something we've got locked down and we're going to even tie more points to it as we go through this tonight to be able to show these periods of time but it, it's really the year i i could say i'm about 99 percent certain that it's next year and you all know why and we've shared it we've broken it down many people didn't like that, which is why we went from, you know, three closer to four, 4,000 and change views to 1,500 to 2,000 and change views because suddenly people don't want to hear next year. Well, I like the truth and it doesn't mean because we think next year and believe it's next year. It doesn't mean we're not watching. We're always watching. But there are things that have been revealed to us in scripture that we can't toss aside. All right. There's no way to throw them aside. And I'm trying to get that across as, as best I can in so many of the teachings recently. And um, hopefully it's making its way. And for anybody that did leave and, and wants to come back, you're free. Everybody is free to come back anytime they want. There is no judgment. There's no condemnation. I get it. Some people just know it can't be. And then they they want to go do other things or see other things. Everybody's welcome back anytime, no matter what, you're always free to come back. All right. So um, with that, it was a little bit longer than usual open because I just needed to get some of that off my chest in case people were wondering, you know, I, there was nothing posted yesterday and it was past its due time. So I wanted to let you guys know um, I'm not leaving you hanging. I, I needed a breather and could probably still use more, but that's OK, because as you guys know, I've said it many times. The, it's it's revealing the revelation and sharing it and doing these teachings that that energize me. All right. So I'm not going anywhere for anybody that's new. Let me have my sip of coffee. For anybody that's new or newer, you're going to hear some crazy things. You may have heard it in the opening. Me saying seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. You're going to think I'm just a nut job. Well, I promise you. The end of days is truly a period of years called 14 years. And there's a little portion called above, which equals 50 days before the 14 years begin. We have broken it down from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation in dozens and dozens and dozens and hundreds of places, showing these things and events that will take place during those times. It is absolutely fantastic. And that's one of the reasons why I scratch my head, too, because I can't understand for the life of me how people can come into these revelations and begin to understand and then walk away as if they've never understood it. You know, we always had a, a saying here, once you see it, you can't unsee it. So hopefully those that do leave and maybe never come back, hopefully they're, uh, they're not leaving the revelation of what they've come to understand behind. So with anybody that's new, this is the playlist right here, the playlist link on YouTube. 
you come to this one right here, the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. There's 12 videos in there. The first four are the key videos. And you can come to ministryrevealed.com. So you can watch it from there, but you can also come to ministryrevealed.com. We have a book that we wrote in 2020. You can get it on Amazon, paperback or ebook. But for those that don't want to pay, we're not trying to make a bunch of money off this at all. <laughs> Believe me. Um, there's free PDF download in English and a total of five languages. There's an audio free download in uh, English. And you can actually literally read the book from the website. The only thing that needs updating in the entirety of the book is the year count. So where we had believed at that time the 70 years was and uh, compared to obviously it not being that. It doesn't push out any of the chapters. It doesn't push out, you know, when you get to the portion of chapters to years. It doesn't push any of that stuff out. All you do is adjust where the years are to the year count. And we've got the new charts and everything else. Um, I am planning to update that book eventually, but it's only the only updates that will take place are the ones in relation to uh, the 70th year. That's it. Everything else is the same. Nothing will change because it's all true. And we've revealed it, as I m mentioned a moment ago, from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. Like when I say beginning of Genesis, I mean literally from the word in the beginning. That's how that's how from the beginning, I mean. So from that intro series that you saw on YouTube, you can also come to the website. You click on that link from the menu called intro series and you scroll down and here's that first video. This video is a 22 minute intro video that you can download on your device or you can just watch right here. And it's an intro video about these next three videos that follow then once you really grasp it we got a little divider here for going deeper this goes into the real deeper parts about it and really starts to open it up for you so that's what this one does it introduces you to the next three and when you get to this one you're going to see things anybody who has read scripture knows there are differences within the gospels there, some people call them contradictions. Some people try to justify them and say they were just perspective. I recently heard, but I've heard it before as well, that um, purple and scarlet, well, well, scarlet and purple, I mean, if you look at it in a certain light from a certain angle, one could have seen purple and one could have seen scarlet. No, one is purple and one is scarlet. And how can I prove it? Well, because in the end of days, the woman riding the beast was wearing purple and scarlet. It wasn't purple that looked like scarlet or scarlet that had a reflection like purple. It was wearing purple and scarlet. And I could prove it by going to Luke's gospel because Luke's gospel doesn't say purple nor scarlet. It says a gorgeous robe. It has the word gorgeous, which means right, white, radiant, and beautiful. Those things can't be explained by just perspective. Otherwise, the disciples and the apostles and all of them were, were colorblind. And we know that's not the case, of course. You'll see so many differences, and this is just a 30-minute Bible study intro, and you can download the study notes from it as well. You will begin to understand, if you have studied Scripture, these questions that at some point you must have had reading the Gospels. And it will blow your mind, because all of these differences within the Gospels are prophecy. Literal prophecy built into the is revealing the was. It's incredible. And when you understand that the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end are Luke, Mark, Matthew, you'll realize why there are three discourses. One in Luke is the above, Mark's is the seven years of seals, and Matthew's is the seven years of trumpets. It will reveal the true end of days. This is another 30-minute intro into the revelation of the 14 years. <laughs> and then this video is a big one. This one's two hours and 45 minutes, and you're going to understand how all of this was missed. It, it simply wasn't time. It wasn't time. The Lord was making it known for the end to prepare people. But you'll notice that it's all because of Matthew, because for hundreds of years, the foundation of all gospel teachings have come from the book of Matthew, from the seminaries, from everywhere. It has all been founded by going to the book of Matthew. Well, just about everybody in the seminaries and everything knows that the book of Matthew is written to the house of Judah, to the Jews. 
that some kind of had maybe some sort of an idea in Mark, but not really. And in Luke, they never really understood either. Well, Luke is to the Gentile bride of Christ. Mark is to the world, the house of Israel, the Gentiles grafted in that are left behind. And Matthew is to the house of Judah, the Jews. And we've all been learning for hundreds of years throughout generations in the foundation of Matthew, which is to Judah. Which means what? You're only going to see seven years of tribulation. Why are you only going to see seven years of tribulation? Because you're all of your perspective, all of your understanding and foundation comes from the gospel of Matthew, which is his discourse, the seven years of trumpets. When you realize who Mark is written to and his discourse and the reason for the differences, it's the seven years of seals. When you go to Luke's and realize it's completely different than the other two, it's because it's the portion called above. It's going to blow your mind and you'll begin to understand it in this one as well. So with that being said, got that one done. Let me see what else. Oh, yeah, that's this is to another section. We'll get to this in a little bit. All right. So it was a brother. I think it was a brother that was sharing. Um, I remember the brother, but I, I can't remember if it was this portion he had shared or something else that he, he caught my attention on something. And I went and looked and I started finding something else. And I was like, ah, and that's what we're going to go into today. We're going to go see these other places that brought me to little aha moments. And what happens is usually I'll go like Luke, Mark, Matthew, right? So we know it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the Bible tells us that it, the last will be first, the first will be last. Well, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end is Luke, Mark, Matthew. And wouldn't you know it? That's exactly how the end of, the end of days play out. And what are we told? As it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. Well, you know why that's funny is because when you get the revelation of the understanding of the creations that took place from in the beginning, you'll see that it's Luke's group first, Mark's group second, Matthew's group's third. It'll blow your mind. It is so mind-destroyingly incredible to understand, which you'll see on the website in that intro series when you get to the very last video. It's a mind bender, and it really, really will just have your jaw on the floor but you definitely don't want to start there. So generally what I would do with this story is, is I would start in Luke and then go to Mark and then go to Matthew because we're looking at pre-stuff, mid-stuff, and then post-trip stuff. Okay, when he comes at the uh, at the, for 40 days and when he comes for the end of seals and when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of trumpets. But in this case, because of all the goodies that are in this and especially the goodies that are in Luke's portion and how that's going to lead us to talk about a lot more of the beginnings. Okay. This, these, these portions of, of the, the first worker bride that when the pre-trip goes, we know this remnant worker bride portion remains that he calls his little flock. Who's bringing in this greater flock. It's, it's more insight and more detail for us. So, Here's something we've shared many times. In fact, if you go, you can go into the website as well. But in the playlist, let me click on the playlist. I don't like these commercials, but maybe I could pause so it. So you think time. you know. There we go. Okay. So in this playlist, you're going to see this video right here. Pre-mid post. So in the triumphal entry, the transfiguration, and the resurrection stories in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, you see a prophetic picture within all three it doesn't mean that when he comes pre-trib that he's coming at the feast uh, uh at passover it's just a prophetic picture within all three of his coming for 40 days after the pre-trib takes out is taken out he returns from the wedding on the eighth day the son of man is going to be here for 40 days before he's done pentecost what we call pentecost or acts 2.0 happens and then the 14 years of seven and seven begins you see in the triumphal entry the transfiguration and the resurrection a picture of those three portions of the lord coming okay so that's what you're going to find in there also and the reason i wanted to bring that up first is because you could see this is obviously 
connected to the time when the the Passover meal and all this stuff is coming, right? So he's having the Passover with disciples. And I don't want people to get twisted that might be newer and say, oh, so it's connected to Passover. So the pre, mid, and post are all Passover. No, nope. the answer to that is found in Deuteronomy 16. We've covered it many times for anybody that's new. And at one point, we're going to touch at one point, uh, uh, one portion of it as well to show that, but not yet. So listen to this. This is Peter's denial. So we, we're, we're at the Passover meal. He, he talks about the institution of the Last Supper, uh, the drinking of the wine, and so forth. Then in Matthew 26, starting in verse uh, 31, then said Jesus unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, okay, anybody that's new, don't fret on this, don't worry on this, don't concern yourself with what I'm exaggerating in my words here. But for those that are uh, that have been around for a little while, there it is again. OK, we maybe have touched on it years in the past, but he says, but after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Remember what this means. If there are differences in the Gospels. He's being prophetic. Hello. The differences in the Gospels are prophetic. And then he goes to Peter's denial, goes to Gethsemane, Gethsemane, and this is the, this is the only story we see. Okay, it's right after the Lord's Supper, and we see something very, very important again. Well, what about this? When when the shepherd is it, when they smite the shepherd, you know, <laughs> I, I was just about to go off course and and go to another piece of scripture where we've talked about this smiting. That's going to take place again, but I'm not going to go there because, you know, we know it from Aaron and Moses. They struck the rock twice. Once was because of Moses. Once was because of Aaron. And the one that's only been fulfilled is the one because of Moses. There is still one for the priestly line. But we're not going to go there today. But when do we know that? When he will be, when, uh, um, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd. Okay, so he's going to be struck. And what happens? And the sheep of the flock will be scattered abroad. What do we know in this ministry, for those that have been around for a while at least, what do we know this period of time is? This is mid-trumpets, right? Let me Let me bring up one of our charts. Okay. Here's our 14-year overview, the above and the 14 years. Pre-trip bride, son of man here for 40 days. See, it's even updated, August 2024. Then at the end of 50 days, Jerusalem is attacked by the lion. And there's the bear, the leopard, Antichrist comes on the scene. There's, after six years of seals, the 144,000 are sealed. Then the great multitude rapture. Then you've got three and a half years of trumpets where the Lord is on Mount Zion. They're rebuilding the city and the streets. And then at the fifth trumpet, which is mid trumpets, that will have been 10 and a half years approximately, leaving three and a half years to go to the end of trumpets and to the end of 14 years. What is Matthew's portion? It's the seven years of trumpets. We're in Matthew's discord, uh, uh, in Matthew's gospel. And what are we looking at before the crucifixion and resurrection when he returns feet down? Well, we know he was here for about three and a half years in the rebuilding of the city and the streets. Remember, he comes at the end of the sixth seal. He's here during the, the seventh year of seals where there's no devastation, right? It's, it's the assembly to him like uh, unleavened bread, the seventh day after six. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you have the seven years of trumpets for which he's here for about three and a half years for a total of 10 and a half years of tribulation to the fifth trumpet. So where does that put this when the shepherd is going to be, when they're going to smite the shepherd and the sheep are going to be scattered abroad? Where is this directly related to in the book of Matthew? 
it's related to when the pit is open. It's related to when Satan is cast down and the pit is open, right? We know where this is. This is directly related to the uh, um, uh, Matthew fleeing into the wilderness. This is the abomination time of Matthew chapter 24. And what else is it? Where is this wording in this period of time that we've revealed in the scriptures? It's right here. Daniel chapter 12. Watch this. In Daniel chapter 12, verse, it's starting verse, uh, verse six and verse seven. And one, and one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time and times and a half. We know what this is. This is this picture right here. This is the two and a half years that are the two woes from the fifth trumpet to the end of the sixth trumpet. That's a period of two and a half years from when Satan is cut down and Messiah is cut off. And listen to what it says. And liveth forever and ever, that that time shall be for a time, times and a half. Two and a half years. There's no and in between, remember? And when he shall have accomplished to what? To scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So another group being scattered, the Matthew discourse fleeing into the mountains until what? Lasting for about two and a half years until it's finished. This finished is the exact same thing that we see when the seventh trumpet in Revelation 10 is about to sound. Soon as it begins to sound, the mystery of God is finished. You see? You can even see it here on the chart. So when it's over, there's that. The, it, the mystery is over, see? The mystery of God is finished. Revelation 10, 7. Because this is when he returns now, feet down on the Mount of Olives to begin that final year, which is the day of the Lord and the year of his wrath. So we get it where Matthews is, and we just saw a scattering, and we know that there's something connected to him doing it again. We've covered it many times. We've got full breakdowns of videos about this. We can show it in so many places. We've even shown it here. You see, so we just showed it connected to the right before he goes to crucifixion in that typology picture. And then we see it right here. Right? When he is, when the son of man be risen again. If, if it's not supposed to be again, why would, why would it say again? When the other places don't. You see? Now let's move on. Let's go to Mark's. So we can show where that difference is in Matthew's. Let's see what it says in Luke's. Uh, sorry, sorry, in Mark's. He has the Passover meal. Now it's the institution of the Lord's Supper. And then Peter's denial. Verse 27, Ma uh, Mark 14. And Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. Okay? Where's the word again? There's no word again. But after I am risen, I will go before you in Galilee. I've often explained this, and it's been a while since I explained it. But the wording that we see in Mark's is the stuff that did already happen. I'm not saying, I mean, I want you to know this, especially if you're newer. I'm not saying that Matthew's portions of those things in his gospel didn't take place. I'm just saying that there are so many differences compounding differences in matthews that when you read it with the end time eyes and you understand these things you actually come to a point reading matthew's gospel and you have a hard time seeing how so many of these things actually already took place it's that loaded with prophetic revelation marx has a lot too but you have to remember when you realize <laughs> excuse me when you realize who 
Jesus came for. He didn't come for the spirit filled. Just like when the bride pre-trib escapes that, that pre-trib bride being taken, they're the ones in Christ spirit filled. He doesn't need to save them. They're already saved. They're, they're, they're gone. They're being taken out because their reward for having been uh, uh, having been diligent and loving and loving each other and loving the Lord and faithful and so forth. Their reward is they're gone. Spirit takes them out. So who is he coming for? He's coming for the Mark group, just like he did the first time. That's my point. When he came the first time, he told them, I am not come, but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what he said. Who is Israel today? Well, nobody knows. The house of Israel scattered all over the world. There are thousands of years of, of mingling with the Gentiles. So nobody really knows exactly who they are. That's because they're essentially, quote unquote, the world or the church. And you can still say the world because there's more coming in still. There might still there's still some leaving too, right? But there will be more coming in in the greatest revival in all of human history, which will begin in the end of days. So just like when he comes for his 40 days in the above portion after the pre-trib, he's coming to shed the light in the darkness to the house of Israel, to the world. Those are the ones he's already died for. Yes, he died for the spirit field. Yes, he's died for all of us. For all sin, he has died. And when he does this thing again, that I'm not going down that tonight, he's not doing it for the same reason. We have teachings on why, and it's all because of Aaron and the priestly line. Go read Leviticus chapter one. And then when you read it, read it in reverse and think of Jesus's birth, Think of Jesus when he died as the lamb. And then, wait a second, you got one more. Whose sacrifice is it? It's the priestly Aaron line. Hello. But that's for another story. See, it's such a fascinating conversation and, and revelation that eh, sometimes I want to go down there. But I, people have already stopped watching so much. I better not go down that path too much to here tonight. So. What am, I, what am I saying in relation to this? That just like when he came for the first time, he came for, quote unquote, the Marx group. And from the Marx group, there is a there's a group who's the Luke group that is mingled of everybody who is ready, watching, diligent, spirit filled in Christ. They're going. They're the winter wheat. This group is also going to be a wheat group. But they're the spring wheat, as we've shown. Wait until you see I'm building this all up, man. All of these things tonight are going to be connected like they always are. So what are we seeing here? It's not about. But after that, I'm risen again. It's after that, I'm risen. Why? Because this is something that was already fulfilled. When he's talking about, again, that's why I say in Matthew, sometimes it's hard with prophetic understanding and seeing with these end time eyes to say, well, wait a second. Did that happen? Okay, well, I know it happened, but we've got these stories mixing together and there's clear differences. There was no reason to say again if he was just saying the same story is here. You see? And if he came the first time to shed his light to those who were in darkness as the creation of days group, as, as those that he came for, the house of Israel that's mixed in with the Gentiles who are grafted in, which is exactly what we see after the seven days in, in Genesis 8, when the dove goes out again and plucks, which is the word harpazo in the Greek, it's what? It's the branch, the, the grafted in. So there's this is the one that took place is the way you can look at it. So you're not seeing it again. So it's just interesting seeing these differences. And what do we see? For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. Well, what do we know happens? We know there's a scattering of sheep coming. That's still going to happen during seals too. Okay, now watch this. When we go to Luke's version, we saw the differences also in Matthew and in Mark 
these the the conversation that was before. Okay, he was having the Passover meal. He was talking about the 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 supper and then and the wine story. Look at what you see in Luke's, which is different than the other ones. You have that story of who's the greatest. Listen to what it says. We'll start in verse 25. You'll see how this connects in a little bit too. And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles. Well, what do we know about seals? It's the Gentiles mixed in with the house of Israel. So whether you want to call them Gentiles, house of Israel, they're grafted in together. And we know from Luke's discourse that until the end of, or the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. When's the end of the fullness of the Gentiles? The end of seals. Hello. So isn't it fitting that here in Luke's, we have this story right before the one about Peter's denial, which is vastly different than the others, and specifically speaking to a group of people. Listen to what it says. And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But you shall not be so. Now, who's he talking to here? You're going to see that he's talking to his little flock of sheep. He's talking to his pre-trib bride that remains, that, that remnant portion from the pre-trib bride that was taken, the group that remains that we know is connected to the Luke 24, is connected to Smyrna, in, in all of these things. That's connected to Romans 16 in the, in the Priscilla's and Aquila's who put their necks on the line. For who? The churches of the Gentiles. You see? And then it says, but you shall not do so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief as he that does serve. For whether for whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth. Is not he that sitteth at meat? But I am among you as he that serveth. Isn't that interesting? Here's the story in Luke. To the disciple remnant portion that's about to go work to bring in the Gentiles. And the Lord is here serving them as they sit down and eat. And what do we know about this story? It's all connected to his little flock who he said that that first watch group, he would come and serve when he returns from the wedding. How fitting, right? How fitting. It's right there again. And uh, you are they which have continued with me in my temptations. You're, you're the group that stayed with me in my temptations. Well, what's the prophetic story of this? Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Again, another one in relation to what it says that we know well. See, here they are, those that are in Christ, spirit-filled. We're, we're, we're in this flesh for now, but we're living by the Spirit in Christ. And what do we know about this spirit in Christ? Well, we know they're the first group, those that are filled with the spirit of God. They are the sons of God. And what does it say? They're part of the adoption, right? We've been adopted. We cry, Abba, Father. And in Romans 8, 16, it says, the spirit itself bears, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, comma and joint heirs with christ that always blows me away joint heirs with christ could you imagine telling somebody oh yeah i'm a joint heir with christ huh christ is way above you what are you talking about according to scripture you're a joint heir with christ brothers and sisters so long as you what as paul said if you remain in christ see there's no walking away. We can have bad days, grumpy days, rough days, sad days. But we just open our word, the scriptures, and ah, we can take a deep breath and just get lost in them, right? So if so be that what? 
that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Here's that same group. That's the remnant portion that remains. Now, as I've said before, are these things that have taken place in the is? Of course they are. These are all things that happen in our daily lives and people suffering more than others and being put to death for it and so forth. But remember, there is prophecy in Scripture. In all Scripture, the was and the is reveal the is to come. That's the mystery. The only thing is, is it couldn't be really seen until the books were opened, until the Gospels were revealed, which began six years ago. Who are those that will suffer with them to be his joint heirs and be glorified with them? You're going to be a joint heir with Christ. So what would a joint heir with Christ? If Christ is going to be ruling and reigning in the end of days for a thousand years, wouldn't a joint heir do the same with them? Have a portion in it with them? Wouldn't it mean that, like it said, that as he suffered, then the joint heirs would suffer? So that they can also be glorified together with them? Of course, it's the same story. Over and over and over again, these are the same stories. Back to Luke 22. There's a lot of good stuff in Luke 22 in this portion. Now, remember what we just spoke about. <coughs> okay? So, you're not to rule over them like their leaders, like their kings did. You're not to exercise this authority upon them, but you're to serve them. Okay? You're to serve them. And you guys were the ones with me in my temptations. You're with me here during the 40 days. And what does he say? Well, remember, they're going to be joint heirs with them, right? So what does he then tell them? In Luke 22, verse 29, And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father has appointed unto me that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, how about that? What if we go to this group that is resurrected from the dead? They're the ones that have part in the first resurrection, who we know on such the second death has no power. They never took the mark. They were here during the time of seals. They died for not taking the mark or worshiping the beast or doing any of those things. And they were his remnant worker bride. And like Priscilla and Aquila, they put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles because it's still during the Gentile age till the end of seals. That's what the church has drastically missed. We know that they're Smyrna because Smyrna says they're the ones that won't be hurt by the second death. You see how it's all connected? Over and over and over, these portions are all connected. Back to Luke 22. Come on. There we go. So we can see who this group is. Uh, you're going to see in other parts, too, where it, it says you're not to lord over them like their lord, like theirs did, right? You're not to, to benefit, be benefactors, not benefit, but benefactors as those guys, okay? You're to serve them, like our brother Steve in Uganda likes to teach on all the time. It's not to have this authority over them and this lordship over them. It's to serve them. He talks about that. That's one of the main things that he talks about, okay? There's that group that the Lord is teaching while what? While he's... Serving them dinner. This is that this is that remnant bride dinner when he returns from the wedding. And we know who they are because they're the ones that are going to receive a kingdom to rule and reign with them. It's all the same group. We'll even see more connections to that in a moment. But now watch this. Now we come into Peter's denial section. And again, remember the differences are prophecy. And it's not just different. It's way different than it was in Mark or Matthews. First of all, you didn't have this portion connected around it. And it says in 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, 
Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Right off the bat, that is jam-packed. Let's finish to verse 23. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. What's this when you're converted? Well, you remember when this happens, right? This is connected to what we uh, to Acts chapter two at the Holy Ghost, what we call Acts two point oh. So you have a prophetic picture of saying, "Now go and strengthen the brethren when you are converted, when you receive that anointing." Because it was the Holy Ghost, right after the resurrection, it was the Holy Ghost that did these things within men, right to open our eyes, our ears, to circumcise our hearts, to receive the truth of Yeshua Jesus. Okay, now listen to this. Verse 23. And he said unto them, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Well, how about that? <clears throat> Did you read any of this in the other two that were both similar? No. You didn't read any of this. Yet it's supposed to be the same account. It's totally different. You know why it's different? Well, let's have a look through them. Let me see. Which one do I want to start with? Let me see where I want to start. All right, we'll start with that one. Look at what he says here. He says, I'm ready to go both into prison and to death. Do you know that he doesn't say the word prison in the other ones? But death is mentioned? Why wasn't prison mentioned? Because you know who prison is connected to with Satan? Let's go have a look. Let's look at Luke's discourse, chapter 21. What are the chances that the word prison is also only found in Luke's discourse and not Mark or Matthew's? There it is right here. Oh, that's a terrible color. For... It's a terrible color for uh, red letter words. There we go. Okay. But before all these. Remember what this means, right? This is before the 14 years begin. That means this is in the above portion. We know it because it says, but before what? But before nation against nation. Nation against nation begins at the red horse rider, which begins the 14 years at the destruction of Jerusalem after the 50th day from true Pentecost and the Feast of Trumpets begins. So, but before all these, they will lay hands on you <clears throat> and persecute and delivering up into synagogues and into prisons. So they're being brought into prisons and some of you are going to be put to death. So you have prison and death only in Luke's discourse. Only for this group. It's connected to this group because Satan is going after this group more directly in the spirit realm than he is when it comes to trumpets time. Wait until you see this connection. So who do we know the some of you being put to death and the some of you connected to going into prisons? Well, like I said, in, in Mark... And in Matthew's discourse, you don't have the word prisons. Brought before councils, beaten, rulers, testimony. There's nothing about prisons. You see? Nor in Matthew's. So what's the difference here? Well, we just saw that in Luke 22, <laughs> we had another piece of, this, of, the, of the understanding. To know exactly again who these people are, who are working for the Gentiles, who are to serve them, willingly putting their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles. To take part in the suffering as Christ did in his temptations, taking part in it as he did, to be co-heirs with him, to rule and reign and be glorified with him at the end. As it says only in Luke. And. What do we see? Who was the one that came after him? Satan. Satan is the one. Is it because Satan was there in some physical form? 
some some fallen angel people could see and whatever it might look like at mid trumpets when Satan is cast down. I have no idea what that's going to look like. Is it, is it like the old stories? He loses his wings and he's cast down and he's some sort of giant 30 foot, you know, beast man. I, who knows? I couldn't tell you. I don't think it'll be quite that drastic, but the pit is going to open and it's going to be drastic. We know what that's all about, right? They're going to be eating the arms of people and eating pe Oh, it's it's horrifying. And these words are written to us in scripture, okay? But this is the beginning. All of this is in the 40 days, in the 50-day portion, the 40-day piece within the 50 above the 14 years. What does he say to him? Satan has desired to have you and to sift you as wheat. As wheat. What is the word for wheat, brothers and sisters? Well, let's have a look. We like this one, right? The word wheat. Sorry, I got this. Abortion keeps showing up on my end. There we go. Look at this. Grain, especially wheat. Corn, meaning wheat. That's what it's telling you. <clears throat> Haven't we been covering that? We've been covering this uh, a fair bit, not not a lot, but we've been going through this uh, because of Deuteronomy 16. Look at what it says. We know the pre-trib is connected to the true feast of weeks. And what, it say, what does it say? Begin to number seven weeks from such time as you begin to put the sickle to the corn. We know there was no corn there. So what is corn? Wheat. Wheat. This is why. The count begins to the Feast of Weeks, not from uh, uh, Nisan, but from when the sickle is put to the wheat, which is Taurus. Which is why from Taurus, which is now the month of Sivan, the third month on the Hebrew calendar, if you go look to about the, the 15th day of the month in Sivan, it's always right around that time that, guess what? The wheat harvest begins. It's awesome. We just got a confirmation in the Greek. It's wheat. How many times have, have I been trying to explain that Deuteronomy 16 is not kind of, not 99%, I understand deuteronomy 16 prophetically in the end of days 100 percent as much as i understand the revelation of who the gospels are speaking to and the 14 years and this is another confirmation who is this wheat portion the first fruits of the feast of weeks of the wheat harvest that remnant portion bride that remnant worker who is wheat, which is why I have no idea why people are looking in winter. Look at what the weather is down here in Calgary or up here in Calgary. It's minus six degrees Celsius. So what's that about? Uh, 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 low mid 20s to you Americans with snow. We've got like five. Oh, I don't know. Five inches or so outside that came late this afternoon. And it was raining before that. So it's like skating rink cars accidents and, and cars stuck on hills and left there for the night i mean it's crazy right hopefully it won't stay but it's begun so let me ask you this am i looking for for a pre-trib escape to happen now no the winter wheat is way over we're 100 percent connected to wheat and now we can even add to the evidence right here we can connect it to the prison we can connect it with the prison and death we can connect it to the wheat we can connect it to to the meal where he's serving them and that they're with him in his temptations connected to the 40 days picture and there's still one more satan was the one desiring to kill him why do we have this story only in luke well it's interesting because guess what all of these things, prison, death, Satan, 
are all connected to, you guessed it, Smyrna and the original 14thers. <laughs> but take a deep breath. <laughs> what does it say? In Revelation chapter 2, 8, and for anybody that's new, you want to understand the seven churches and how they play out in relation to prophecy, go to the Ministry Revealed book. I think it's like page 126 or something like that. You'll see uh, the the understanding of Smyrna. There's a video in the intro series as well or uh, on the, the intro page on the website as you learn more and you go further down into it. It's incredible. We It's revealed here. We know how the seven churches and what their typology is playing out to the end of days. And it says, unto the church of Smyrna. And Smyrna is the above portion. So this is the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. The group that's here with them for 40 days, the, the Luke 24, this Luke 22 group, this, this uh, uh, um, uh, Smyrna, Priscilla's and Aquila's, those who put their necks on the line to be resurrected, to rule and reign with them for a thousand years. It's all Smyrna. This is all the same group. So it says under the church of Smyrna, write these things, say it the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So there's a group that's going to be coming against this group who are the Jews or claiming to be Jews. It doesn't mean everybody in the land of Israel that says they're Jews. It means that they're not really Jews. They're just, they're false, they're false Jews. No, there's a whole bunch of them over there that are actually Jews. And they may hate you because you're a Christian, but that's for our benefit. Remember, Paul told us that in Romans. It's for our sakes that they've been blinded. That's why we know there's still something else coming for them when they will understand it. He's already died for sin. He's not dying for sin again. When he comes at the end of seals, they're going to recognize him and cry out and repent because that's the one they've been waiting for. Oh, it's the same one. But that's the one they've been waiting for. Because he's going to destroy their enemies at the end of the sixth seal, right at the end of the first six years. And then when the great multitude goes in and trumpets begin, the temple's going to get rebuilt. It's not Antichrist that rebuilds it. That's who they've been waiting for. That's why the Christians, you know, I've said it a number of times. That's why Christians keep thinking, ah, Antichrist is going to build the temple and the Jews are going to fall for the Antichrist because he's going to be the one building the temple. No, he isn't. Nope. The Lord will be there and the other anointed one with him Zerubbabel, whoever the modern day Zerubbabel is, will be with him, and he's the one overseeing in the rebuilding. Hello. It's so beautiful when you can understand the clarity of these things. But are there some who say they are Jews but are not? Yes. Is it all is it all Jews? Of course not. But there are some powerful Jews or claiming to be Jews but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So how do you think Satan is going to attack and try to get those who Jesus is speaking to in Luke chapter 22? Well, you think it's a coincidence that Smyrna is the group that's with him in his temptations, that's connected to Luke and to the Priscilla and Aquila and putting their necks on the line and all these things and, and Satan wanting to sift them like wheat? Do you think it's by chance that it's Smyrna? At the beginning, that is the group when Satan wants to come after them. He's going to do it through those who say they are Jews but are not. How is he going to do it through Jews who say they are Jews but are not? Because this group, as we know from Luke chapter 24, they're going to have something like, um, um, I believe, like uh, Philip. There's going to be a translation that happens, if you remember. Right in, uh, what is it, uh, Acts 7 or 7 or 21? I mix it up now. When when he gets translated, right? He he baptizes the eunuch in, in the river or in the lake. And as the eunuch gets out of the water, boom, 
Phillips already gone. He's, he's, he's in another city. He was translated. That's what I believe is going to happen to this remnant worker bride who is here with the Lord and his temptations for those 40 days. I believe they're going to be translated to somewhere around Jerusalem and then we'll be in Jerusalem before it all breaks out. How do we know? Because that's exactly what he told them the first time. All right. When he said in Luke 24, 47, among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And of course, only in Luke do we read that it begins at Jerusalem. Okay. There is a reason for these things. And if you're new, we've got it in other teachings, but there's a reason for it. And that's because this group will begin from Jerusalem. So again, when you see this connection in Smyrna and how the Jews that say they're Jews but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan and are going to be the ones persecuting you, well, now it starts to make sense how Satan, through these ones who are saying they're Jews but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan, are going to be the ones desiring through Satan in them to sift you. Just as he's telling them right here to sift them as wheat. Look, even if you go to Luke's discourse, we saw prison and death, as we saw here, and we see that who puts them there? They shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering, up, delivering you up into the synagogues. Why would it be the synagogues? Being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Because they're going to be going after them. I'm sorry, guys, but you see this but before we know where this is. This is during the 40 days this is going to begin. So it's going to be terrible persecution against this remnant group of workers right off the bat. That's what it's telling us. We've now seen it in Luke 22, Luke 21. We saw it from Romans 8 in their connection. We saw that um, uh, uh, to Smyrna directly. We saw it to Priscilla and Aquila. We've seen it in many places, and you're going to see even more tonight. This is happening for the remnant worker bride who were originally called 14thers. You see? But he gave us the instructions. He gave us the instructions. But Satan's coming for him right away. How, how would he know to come for them right away? Because they're the Lord's. You see? The Lord is there with them. The Lord is going to be here with them for 40 days. And this is going to be the group that he brought into some place where he's going to have a meal with them and serve them and open their understanding. This is the same group as we see, again, in Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> Luke 24. This same corn wheat group, when he served them, he sat at meat, served them. And while he opened to us the scriptures, the same hour returned to Jerusalem. He served them, served them. And what did he do? We've talked about this one. This is always so good. In verse 44, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. Okay, they're not all fulfilled even yet, which are written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms. Remember when we used to speak about this, how awesome this was? Because where did the revelation begin for us in the Old Testament? It began in the Psalms. It then went into a number of the prophets and then into the law of Moses. And I told you the story <clears throat> when I realized this was happening here in the ministry. Not the, not the full thing. It's the preparation that's happening right now. And when the Lord comes, whoever this group will be, this is what he's opening to them. And we had already had the Psalms. We had a little bit of the prophets and a little bit more was coming. And I remember reading this and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Oh my goodness. This is what's happening. This is the opening of the books. And when it hit me, 
I got really nervous because I still didn't really know anything in the first five books or the law of Moses. Look at where we've come from those. Maybe that was what, three or four years ago, three and a half to four years ago. Now look at it. We've even got the creations. We can show the creation stories into each gospel of Luke, Mark, and Matthew and their portion of people. It's awesome. It's so awesome. But you see, this is what he's coming to do. Do you think there's a reason knowing the differences now in the gospels, why this is in Luke's gospel, but not in Mark and Matthew's? Why this, these beautiful stories of, of their, their commission, what they're to go do is so different than Mark and Matthew's? You see, this is the group that begins in Jerusalem. Satan is Satan through the Jewish group is the group persecuting them. And it just so happens that that the Smyrna group, the ones putting their necks on the line, being put into prison and to death, are directly connected to where Satan is first mentioned in the seven churches of only two places. And how fitting, excuse me, and how fitting that the other place where Satan is mentioned is the Church of Philadelphia. All right, where is he? Where is he? Is it Philadelphia? There it is. So you have the synagogue of Satan. Why, why is Philadelphia here? Well, because Philadelphia is directly connected to the 144. And when they receive the additional anointing from the, from the Lord through the Holy Ghost, and it's the second half of trumpets. Right? They are the first half, but it's the second half of trumpets when Satan is cast down and the pit is open. And Satan is going to come to go after him. Two worker groups. The, the, the remnant worker bride and the 144,000. Satan trying to go after each. Of course. The other ones he could deceive with all sorts of things. With the mark of the beast and everything else. But what about these guys? This is These are the Lord's workers. <clears throat> and the first one is his corn slash wheat group All right let's go back into luke so now that we know this group is that is that wheat group that satan wants to sift they're they're the ones that will go to prisons and into and, and to death we know it's directly connected to the luke group we also know it's connected to the flock to this little flock let's go back to that in luke chapter 12 in Luke chapter 12, such a, a great connection to these stories, right? Of course, these are all just man-made breaks, but the stories keep going, right? So if you go into Luke 12:31, uh, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock. There's a reason why little flock. In fact, I think I have that one highlighted right here. Uh, not right here. Okay, fear not little flock. Okay, it's not all Christians. This one, he is speaking to a group of Christian disciples, a group of Christian disciples. We know who they are. It's the same group we've been talking about. It's a group of Christian disciples that he's speaking to when he's talking about the little flock. Okay, and this little flock, because he is the shepherd. We are his little flock, right? That remnant worker group will be his little flock. But when he's gone, before he comes back as the great shepherd, he has this little flock watching over the main flock. That's what their job is. That's what's going to be happening during sales, bringing about the greatest revival and salvation in all of human history through this small group of people called little flock. But they will have the added advantage of also having the apostles with them this time. Okay? Just like it was the first time. But a lot more specific. A lot more specific and pre-understood. Okay? Do you think there's a reason why it's only found in Luke chapter 12? No other gospel? Only that place in Luke? Two places we're going to get to in 1 Peter 5? 
connected to First Peter, which is all about this remnant worker bride? Watch this. Because wait until you see where it connects. Okay? So, and all these things shall be added unto you. So remember, prophetically, we're talking about seeing this group in the end of days that, that remained with them through his temptation that will be anointed with the Acts 2.0 anointing of the Holy Ghost on the 50th day at true Pentecost in the year that it will begin, which I believe will be 2024. And he says in verse 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which, which, which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that fadeth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupts. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, I am not saying in reading this, go sell everything you have and go and do your work for the Lord. I'm saying there may be a time coming in your life when the end of days begins that if you are part of his little flock, which I believe is being prepared in this ministry, but not only, not only, but being prepared in this ministry and not everybody. It's also happening, as we saw with uh, our sister Petra. She's working to, to prepare a remnant bride group with, with her ministry. Steve is working it in Uganda with uh, Victor and their team over there. So there are others. Mike over at Interrupts 165, he is working it. And with his group and, and his, and his uh, following over there, even though all of us are, are all connected in some way. And there's probably more. But what this is telling you, and this is why, I've, I've said it many times. When you look at this chart, for example, the, the chapters to years, in all of these chapters, we get little verses of insight into events that will take place in this year, this fourth year of SEALs. You see, you're not going to get everything all laid out in one because it's all prophecy. It's glimpses. It's here a little, there a little. Old, new. What was, what is, both of them shall be. And that's what we got here. We got was, we got is, all of them prophetic, giving us insight into what's to come. So what you're seeing here is this prophetic preparation. And if you're chosen to remain, you won't not know. You will absolutely know. You won't be terrified because you've been left behind and uncertain, thinking that you've missed the pre-trib. No. Because we know that this conversation is the conversation that he's having with the remnant bride group right before the pre-trib escape. He may very well and most likely will tell us to sell everything Sell everything you got. When he tells you to, not me. When he tells you to. Can you support and strengthen the ministry here and abroad until? <laughs> Absolutely. Without you, we couldn't keep doing it. All right. Ask our brother Steve and, and, and how incredible it's been out there. Even here. We can't do it without you. But I am not saying, <laughs> let me reiterate, I am not saying do this. This will be when the Lord makes it known to you if you're part of the remnant bride to remain and you will know it because this is the conversation that he will be having with you. And that's why you could see it in this. You could see it in the other portion of more conversations in Luke 22 that we just saw where he's telling them, look, you guys are going to be with me in my temptation. Here he was serving them. We saw that, hey, Satan's trying. He's going to want to come against you. He's trying to come against you and sift you like wheat, but I've prayed over you. Doesn't mean you're not going to die. Peter died too, right? But some of you are going to be taken to prison. Some of you are going to be put to death. But that your faith won't fail. See, we've the prayers of Christ over this group for protection. That remnant worker group. So you're seeing, that's why I was showing in the chart, 
you're you're getting parts and pieces that build the picture because you're looking at the was and you're looking at the is in events that took place in the was in events that took place in the is from when Christ was here all giving us a prophetic picture and their differences to the is to come so the lord himself right before the pre-trib escape he's going to let his little flock know this little flock will know to sell what they have, to be ready to go out. And then he tells them in the same breath, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding. That when he comes and knocks, he may open immediately. Blessed are those servants. And here he is. We've talked about it many times. It's the Luke 24 connection. He only sits down and to eat and serves this group. You see? Which means he warned them what? Before he went to the wedding. So he's telling his little flock to do this before the wedding. To not worry about what they're going to eat and drink and wear when they go out. That's what the world is going to be worrying about. Kind of interesting, right? For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. This isn't something we're going to have to fear. We might think sometimes, oh my goodness, how are we going to eat? How, <laughs> you know... Where are we going to stay? It's all going to be prepared in the spirits of others. There will be places to stay. There will be foods given and prepared. Everything will be taken care of for that little flock to go out and do the Lord's work. It's awesome. And you see, again, connected to this little flock, which we've been able to show is only out of all the discord, out of all the gospels, only in Luke's, and we know what that means when we go into the word definitions in the Strong's Concordance. But are you ready for this? Let's take this a step further. Because as I was looking at this, <clears throat> I've had this happen a couple of times. Oh, maybe a handful or more times. But not that often usually the easy ones are based on the wording and where they are within the gospels which portions of the gospels how the word is used or if it's just specifically in one gospel to the other this is such a big deal we've taught on this over the years how important it is getting the definitions of the words like having a, a service like this it's free or or three or five or something like that a year to download I have no affiliation with it, except I love it. This is called eSword. You can get many different ones, but I think eSword is the best. You get the KJV Plus attached to it. And look, you get the word definitions. The word definitions multiply your understanding like you would not believe. And you're going to see these types of things that will give you insight prophetically to these portions of people in their times that they're speaking to. Just like I shared in a recent um, uh, short that, and I think even in a recent video, there, there is no word tribulation or even the word associated with tribulation. So maybe it could be tribulation or sorrow or pain, for example, that has the same definition of the Greek word. It's not found in Luke's gospel at all. Did you see there's there's no condemnation? Mike used to say this a lot in, uh, in over on uh, Interrupts 165. There's no condemnation ever found when the Lord is speaking in, in Luke's gospel. Never. But there always is in Mark and in Matthew. Hence the two being left behind. One being the world or house of Israel and the other one being Judah. You see? This is purposeful and meaningful. But the reason I was leading you into it is because of this little flock. We know now and have for a while, we know who this little flock is. Okay? Not that it's everybody in this ministry. Not that it's, you know, most of this ministry. I, I don't know. Do I believe it's some of us? Yes, because there's a reason why we're being prepared like that group in Luke 24. Why would we be prepared in the opening of the books and the revelation of it only for him to 
lay out the playbook and then come and give us the complete book and then say, all right, now you guys are gone and let everybody else go figure it out. It makes no sense, right? I always remember an old brother telling us that, you know, what's the coach is going to give you the whole playbook, lay it all out for you, start to open it, go home and study it. And then when it's game time, you guys can stay home and we're going to bring in the rookies. Doesn't make any sense. And you see, this is another reason that connected to why I was opening with, you know, just being weary. And because part of that weariness comes from expecting and, and desiring and wanting more people to see and to understand what is really happening here. Yet at the same time, I don't necessarily blame people for not wanting to dig so diligently into the revelation <laughs> because you may be chosen to stay and it takes effort. You have to study these things. You have to be diligent in his word. But if you pray over it and you're diligent, I promise you the spirit will open it for you. And you won't have the fear of if you're chosen to be part of his little flock. But now listen to what happens with the little flock. As I found, only one place in the Old Testament does the only place in the New Testament Gospels have a connection about this flock. And wouldn't you know it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little nerve-wracking. <laughs> I know, I was saying, look, don't, don't let, you'll be at ease. Well, kind of. You'll be more at ease having understanding than not. Let's just put it that way. Okay, watch this. Let me go to, uh, let me go see these verses I had. it. There we go. Let's start at verse 13. Okay? Listen to the timing of all of this. Then shall thou say, uh, Jerem it goes to Jeremiah 13, 13. Remember, this is the only place from the only gospel where Luke's little flock, which is the Priscilla and Aquila, the Luke 24, that all the stuff that we've been talking about, this pre-trib remnant bride portion who remains with the Lord for 40 days and then is here during seals. Listen to the only place where the storyline is connected in Jeremiah 13. We'll start in verse 13. Then shall thou say unto them, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of this land even the kings that sit upon David's throne and the priests and the prophets and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with drunkenness. With drunkenness. First of all, we know we have a pretty good connection with this drunkenness, don't we? We know it's at true Pentecost. When Pentecost was fully come, the Holy Ghost came. They were accused of being drunk on new wine they were being accused of being drunk on new wine the only way you can have new wine is if you just had a new harvest and the only time a year that grape harvest take place is from september to october hello we've talked about it a lot lately right how on earth could you have Pentecost connected to Shavuot all the way back in May, late May or early June based on where it moves year by year? It is 100% absolutely unequivocally not possible to have Pentecost in late May to early June. 100% not possible. Where does it actually happen? Every year on the earth, right around this time right here, year after year after year for hundreds of years. So the only way you can get Acts 2.0 or true Pentecost for people to be drunk on new wine or to be made drunk in with drunkenness is to be at Pentecost. That's one thing, okay? It would have to be connected. The, the typology, the picture is the intoxication, see, related to 
Pentecost, not Feast of Weeks. We know it's 50 days later, but what did you just learn? If you're new, you just learned that true Pentecost, I mean, that true Feast of Weeks isn't from a count in Nisan. It's not possible because there is no wheat, which is winter wheat that starts to get harvested in, uh, what would that be, in uh, late May, early June. It's not, it's just, it's approaching the beginning of the wheat harvest. And we just saw that the connection was to what? I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist, right? Let, let, let's, let's show you real, real quick. <clears throat> It was in Deuteronomy 13. We saw corn, which was wheat. And what does Leviticus tell us? What does Leviticus tell you about the Feast of Weeks? Feast of Weeks, uh, two loaves, seven Sabbaths, I'll be over two weeks. With, okay, the two loaves of bread with leaven, connected to what? Feast of Weeks. Two loaves with leaven. So we go to Deuteronomy. We go to Deuteronomy 16. And... We know that it's connected to wheat, not corn, wheat. We've now proven that the Feast of Weeks is wheat, not corn. Okay? It's not, it's not a barley count. It's a wheat count. And we can go to uh, Exodus 34, verse 22. And thou shalt observe the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. You see? So we're not mixing these things up. We're not saying kind of, sort of. We just saw that the Feast of Weeks is the wheat harvest, the first fruits of the wheat harvest. The wheat harvest doesn't begin till generally around, whoops, that's July, generally around somewhere around like this. So you would say, oh, but see, that could be the Feast of Weeks. That No, it can't. Because the Feast of Weeks doesn't happen at the beginning of the harvest. The Feast of Weeks happens at the end. Time frame in here is the end of the winter wheat harvest when they grind it, as I've said many times recently, when they grind that flour up and bake bread with leaven to bring into the churches and the temple. Not maybe. Not kind of, 100% has been happening for hundreds of years, bringing in loaves of bread around the time frame of October 1st for hundreds of years. Impossible to do it back here. Impossible. It's so awesome. This is what I'm telling you guys. When we know these things, you can get it, you can understand it, you can discern it. It's it's there. Let's go back. Jeremiah 13. So we know this drunkenness. We know it's connected. So they're about to have this time frame connected to drunkenness, which is intoxication. In fact, let's go back to Acts chapter 2 again, and let's see the Greek definition. For them being accused of being drunken on new wine. Okay? Ah, oh, look at that. Intoxication. Intoxication and intoxication. Okay? Exact same word definition relating and telling us the same time. Remember, this is important to understand in the context of what I'm about to share because we also saw that little flock was connected to this. In all of the Old Testament, the little flock had a was connection in Jeremiah 13 only. Then he says in Jeremiah 13, 14, and I will dash them one against another, even the fathers and the sons together, saith the Lord, I will not pity nor spare nor have mercy, but destroy them. You see, a lot of people forget we're talking about the end of days. We're not talking about just some haphazard time. We know it's going to be devastation. Is the Lord doing it because he's cruel? No. It's because he has to bring it because people need to wake up. 
And there's nothing better to wake people up than absolutely bringing about chaos and devastation to have them cry out for him. You see, what did it say? In, in Luke 19, starting in verse 41, when he weeps over Jerusalem, again, here's the triumphal entry story, a picture of when he starts his 40 days, another typology that I mentioned earlier. And this wording is only found in Luke. So he weeps over it because he's saying, if you'd only understood, you're about to be compassed about. Things have now been hidden from your eyes because you knew not the time of your visitation, right? It's a prophetic typology in the is to come at his 40 days as well. And look at what verse 44 says. And they shall be laid even with the, uh, uh, and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Men, women, children, old, babies. Not me saying this. The scriptures are saying it. Look at Luke 21. Luke chapter 21 goes into a greater description of this as well. Because again, it's connected to the but before. These are the things during the 40 days. The persecution during the, 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 the flock, right? So again, all of this is connected to that little flock. This is all connected to that time while they're here with him in his temptation during those 40 days for that little flock. And in fact, what is this portion of his temptation? What's this picture of this 40 days? It's the same thing we've taught on many times. In Luke 17, there it is. But first, it's the same connection to but before. He must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. Okay? He's got to suffer. So he's going to suffer being rejected during the 40 days because the world's going to think he's the, the, uh, uh, the, the Muslims are going to think he's the Christian Antichrist and the Christians are going to think that he is the Antichrist. Again, something we know through revelation and we know that the Muslims have the Dajjal guy that they believe is the Christian Antichrist, but they only say he's going to be here for 40 days. There he is. He's going to suffer and be rejected. Exactly as this group and connected to Luke 22 that we were talking about. They're there with him during his, 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 his uh, temptations. Same prophetic picture. And in Luke 21, in relation to the devastation that's coming, we see this here as well. We see the, as we were saying, the but before. This is when they're to flee. So he's warning them, as he said Jonah would, he's going to warn them. Jonah's story and Christ and what he said in Luke, Mark, and Matthew were all prophecy. None of them have been fulfilled yet. Which is why people have been screaming bloody murder that ah, it's written by men. And Muslims love to go to that one that read the Bible to, to look for these discrepancies. And that's one that people have the biggest issue with. We don't. We can prove it here. We have to be willing to seek, study, pray over it, and you'll get it. So this is now the compassing about after he's warning them about it. We know after his 40 days, the compassing about will begin. And what does he say? For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe unto them that are with child and them that suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the nation, wrath upon the land and this people, and they shall fall every one by the edge of the sword, uh, led away captive, trodden down of the Gentiles. This is what I was saying earlier. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Which means that the pre-trib escape, the time of the Gentiles isn't fulfilled. Because the Gentiles are grafted into the house of Israel, which is the world scattered everywhere. What we sometimes or other people call the sleepy church that won't be ready at the pre-trib. They'll be part of the great multitude if they repent and cry out to the Lord. That will be the end of seals in the times of the Gentiles. That's why when you see that the, that the Smyrna's you know, or or the Priscilla's and Aquila's putting their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles. That's why you see in Luke 22 when they're saying who's the greatest, and you know it's the one who serves and and don't uh, don't lord these things over them, but serve them because they're doing it what for the Gentiles, because it's the same picture. 
and all of this dis- the devastation that's about to be unleashed on the world beginning at Jerusalem. Beginning at Jerusalem. Now, we know what comes first. Preacher of escape, the seven-day wedding, the Lord returns on the eighth day. He meets with that group that he had pre-told before, right before the escape. Then he has that meal with them as we're seeing in these typologies. And then he's here for 40 days. They're with him during those temptations while he's being rejected, while the world thinks he's the Antichrist and the Muslims think he's the Dajjal. And he's being rejected. Some will come to him, of course, but the vast majority will not because nobody knows that the Son of Man is coming first after the pre-trib escape. You see? But the enemy has warned the Muslims by calling them the false Christ or Antichrist Dajjal, but he is not. You see? <laughs> so here we're seeing, and he says, uh, and fathers, uh, uh, fathers and the sons together, saith the Lord, I will not pity, nor spare, nor have mercy, but destroy them. That's terrifying, right? We're seeing uh, God of the Old, Old Testament, aren't we? Well, that's exactly what's coming. But he's not doing it out of hate. He's doing it to wake them up before there's nobody left. Verse 16. Uh, Jeremiah 13, verse 16. Give glory to the Lord your God before he caused darkness. And before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains. So he's about to bring darkness. The mountains that you're going to flee to are going to be dark while you look for light. Sound familiar? He turn it into the shadow of death and make gross darkness. That must sound familiar to some of you, right? How about this? You know this one. Come on. Here it is. Isaiah chapter 9. The light affliction that the people walked in darkness have seen a great light. Them that dwell in the shadow of death. Upon them hath the light shined. Hello. Upon them hath the light shined. And what do we know about it? It's connected to the, a child is born unto us, right? We know this is the picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man. But we know, as we've covered a number of times lately, this prophecy, this revelation was fulfilled in the is. So there was a was. Jesus fulfilled it in the is, but we know there's a prophetic picture in the is to come. Did when 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 it was said that Jesus fulfilled it here in Matthew 4, <coughs> afterwards it says, then a great devastation comes from Syria. Did that happen? Did that happen in Jesus' day as he came walking through here after John was imprisoned? Did Syria come and destroy Jerusalem? Nope. Because it's prophecy. It's prophecy. It's still to be fulfilled. Parts fulfilled, parts unfulfilled, pictures and typology, what was, what is, shall be. And so we recently also learned this year, the past few months, that we know it's not directly connected to Jesus' birthday, but connected to when John was then cast into prison. And we know. That Jesus' birthday is about 15th, 16th of Savan. <clears throat> and that it's not from Jesus' birthday. But from when John was put into prison, which was two months, about two months later. And what do we know? This is the seventh Sabbath at the pre-trib escape. This is the beginning of the 50 days. And this is the eighth day after the wedding. We've shared on this a number of times, right? Directly connected to being two months past his birthday. Directly related and revealed to us from Isaiah 9 to Matthew 4. Okay? But look at what the wording was, and this is what we're focusing on. The wording. That the people walked in darkness. Okay? They have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death. Upon them hath the light shine. All of this is more evidence to the time frame 
of what's taking place in Jeremiah 13. It's all in the above portion. He's pre-warning them. <clears throat> he's, he's telling them in drunkenness. He's telling them what's coming. Look, look at what it says. It literally tells you he's warning it before. Give glory to the Lord your God before he cause darkness. Before what? This portion of him right there, exactly connected to his 40 days, that above portion of the 50 days. Listen to verse 17. But if you will not hear it, my soul shall weep. Well, that's we, we heard that, right? In Luke chapter 9, when he weeps over Jerusalem. In the same time frame. My soul shall weep in secret places for your pride. Remember we spoke about it? Pride. I think pride is the number one sin in my opinion. I just, I don't even like the word. I don't use it. I, I think the enemy has completely stolen it, and that's a word that they can have. They can have that word all they want because it's a wicked word. And, and in the last video, I, we talked about how Nathaniel spoke about that as well. It, it's, a, it's, it's terrible in heaven. It was so bad that that was the first thing that he said when it came to sin was pride. That's, ter that's terrifying, right? We gotta we gotta check our hearts always make sure you know you can be bold it's not a that's not pride if you're being bold and and in your convictions and knowing what you're sharing and trying to reach people but there is a prideful way to do that too right so we've got to we got to keep ourselves in check so it says and mine eyes shall weep sore and run down with tears again Luke 19 when he weeps over Jerusalem now listen to what he says because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. The Lord's flock is carried away captive. Well, what did this say? 1317 of Jeremiah, the only place in the Old Testament that was directly connected to the same little flock that was the Lord's flock from Luke chapter 12, verse 32. The Lord's flock carried away captive. The Lord's flock carried away captive. Isn't that what we were saying in Luke 21 for the last several years? The Lord's flock carried away captive. And when we go look at it, what does he say? There's your 40 days. But before all these, but before Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed and the 14 years begins, but before that in the above portion, all the, uh, but before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering up into synagogues and into prisons being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Who's in them doing this? Satan. He's trying to sift the wheat group. The Feast of Weeks, First Fruit Remnant Bride Wheat Group. This is taking place essentially right away because the enemy will know who this group now is. Why do you think so much power and authority has to be given to them? Could you imagine doing what this group is going to have to do during the time of seals without it? It's going to be multiple times more powerful than it was at the first Acts 2. Multiple times more powerful and multiple times more wicked. Because this group with the apostles is bringing in the greatest revival in all of human history that ever shall be from this point ever on. But at mid-trip seals, at the midpoint, is the point, well, about two and a half years, when, when Antichrist gets that power to continue, that's where Luke's discourse, as we've, as we've shared on, and it's the abomination of desolation in Mark. That point is when Antichrist gets those powers to continue 42 months. That's the point. Where it'll be worse than it was since the beginning. That's how crazy we're talking about seals being. 
You see, we've said it many times. The first about two and a half years of SEALs is World War III. And as devastating and famine and, and, and everything, as devastating as that's going to be, the Bible tells us that those two and a half years are just the beginning. It's just, it's just the start. It's just the beginning. Because you'll be, people will be so devastated at that point, so distraught and down and out that haven't come to Christ and repented and, and been given some authority and places of protection throughout the earth. That when the mark of the beast comes, when Antichrist gets that power, the Antichrist is going to be the one everybody's going to turn to who hasn't yet come to Christ. Why would they? Why wouldn't they? They're starving. Their babies are dying on the streets. That's how bad it's going to be. Is this something for any of you guys to worry about? No, because in Christ spirit filled, even if you're just having a child, by the way, Mike is having a new baby. I think she's going to be born in or he or she. I can't recall now in January. Congratulations to Mike and his wife and our brother Steve and his wife Violet over in Uganda just had another baby girl. So they've got three little ones uh, and they just had their, their baby girl, uh, I think, uh, yesterday. Yeah, I think like within the last 24 hours. So a big congratulations to them as well. Is is there any fear for them? No, of course not. In Christ's spirit filled, there is no fear. Right, They're part of the pre-trib or remnant worker, and the families will be taken. Scriptures have laid these things out for us. But when you get to Matthews, that's why you see, and going back to the story, that's why when you get to uh, um, mid-trumpets, and when Satan is cast down and the pit is open and Satan comes back and all the stuff that comes out of the pit, that's why the 144,000 are given even greater power than even the ones these remnant workers had during SEALs. Because they're going to be at a time that is going to be worse than it was at the worst time in SEALs, which was worse since the beginning of time. This will be worse. And then it says, and will never be any worse in it than that point ever again. But the Mark one, it says it will still get worse by going to the Matthew one. Okay? Okay. So there's these powers that are going to have to be given to these people. <clears throat> and so we see this persecution taking place on, on this group. Right off the bat, the enemy is going to know because they had their meal. They were chosen by the Lord to remain. And so we're seeing <clears throat> this place where it's directly connected to that word that this flock is carried away captive. Excuse me. And then it says, um, we'll go through 18, Jeremiah 13, 18. Say unto the king and to the queen, humble yourselves, sit down, for your principalities shall come down, even the crown of your glory. Verse 19, the cities of the south shall be shut up, and none shall open them. Judah shall be carried away captive, all of it. It shall wholly be carried away captive. Lift up your, your eyes and behold them that come from the north. Where is the flock that was given thee, thy beautiful flock? Hello. You see? What, is, what does 21 say? What will thou say when he shall punish thee? For thou hast taught them to be captains and chief over thee. Shall not sorrows take thee as a woman in travail? You see how every part of this is connected to the beginning? It's all connected to the above 14 years. That 50 days or that, that 40, what is it? Uh, 43 days that remain. This is what it says. The cities of the south shall be shut up and none shall open them. Judah shall be carried away captive. All of it, it shall wholly be carried away captive. What do we know about this? Well, again, we go to, we can go to Isaiah 9. 
What do we know? What did it say from the north, right? Who are the ones coming from the north? Syria. We go to Jeremiah chapter 4. We know that Jeremiah chapter 4 tells us that the lion from the north. Who's the lion from the north? It's the same one. See, coming to punish Judah and Jerusalem. They're going to be what? Punished, scattered, taken away. See, the lion has come up from his thicket, the destroyer of the Gentiles. Where is he coming from? He's coming from the north. The lion is coming from the north. It's Syria. And those with Syria, not on the first attack that's coming against Haifa and Tel Aviv that starts the 50 days at the pre-trib escape, but at the end of the 50 days at True Feast of Trumpets, which is called the year's end, as we've seen in so many places with Syria, connected to the year's end when they bring the attack with a smaller army, even though Israel has a bigger army, and Syria destroys them. Why? And then they're taken away captive. And the land is left desolate. It's the same thing. Again, we can go back to Luke. <coughs> what does Luke 21 say in the exact same context, in the exact same portion of time? Listen to what it says. What was Jesus warning them about? The destruction of Jerusalem when they're compassed about. The exact same warning he was giving them during uh, uh, when he weeps over them in Luke 19. When they're to flee to the mountains. Just like he's saying when it's connected to uh, um, to them fleeing to the mountains and them also being taken captive and killed. See? And led them away captive. It's all connected, man. This This had everything in it. This had everything. From the time of drunkenness to the, the fathers and sons and the Lord not having pity and, and destroying them, to them trying to make their way to their mountains in the darkness and seeing the light in the gross darkness, the Lord's flock, the remnant workers who are going to be taken away captive, Judah, which is Judah and Jerusalem, being destroyed and taken away captive, some of them killed. And then he's saying, look, and now, look what's coming from the north. Where is the flock that was given to you? That beautiful flock. Where are they? Well, now, get ready. Sorrows are about to overtake you as, travail, as a woman in travail. All of it connected. And what was this piece for us? Seeing that little catch where this one piece that we knew quite well when you see things like this, when you're looking at Greek words and you're seeing a Hebrew connection, my goodness, can it ever tell you a bunch of details? It's just, it's fantastic. Everything that it lays out for us. Watch this. So we went from Isaiah 9. Now we saw this with this little flock, right? So we saw this little flock. Let's see what I had here. Oh, yeah, that's what it was. This one here. So we saw this little flock in this connection to Luke that brought us to Jeremiah. But where else did it bring us to? It's about feeding the flock of God. Okay? So it's not, it's not specifically speaking that this flock that is being fed is... Because we know the Lord has a flock, right? He is the great shepherd. He's coming for his flock, which is the Mark group, which is the house of Israel, the Gentiles grafted in. He's coming for those that he's coming to shed his light on. The house of Israel, the Gentiles are grafted in. He came for the lost ones. That's, that's what seals is all about. And so this is what he's saying. He's getting the little flock, he's saying, to feed the flock of God. And you can know it by the revelation of it being the Luke group and in 1 Peter chapter 5. Why? Because 1 Peter 1 is jam. I mean, 1 Peter itself is jam-packed with all of the revelations connected to the pre-trib group. In fact, we'll even jump ahead a little bit. and Let me show you that. In 1 Peter 1, remember when we, when he said, um, and Satan... Satan wants to get them, right? The, this group that the Lord has protected? Well, we saw it right here. Here's this group as well. 1 Peter 1, 4. We've talked about this in the past. This is a great piece of pre-trib remnant worker bride scripture. 
First Peter 1 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiable that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept. Listen to this. To be a watcher. Look at this. I'm going to change it to a brighter color. To be a watcher in advance. That kind of detail. So you got a group who is kept by the power of God. Who are to be watchers in advance. Hello. Doesn't get any more clear. It's that same group. Again and again and again as we're seeing here. So this, this little flock who's going to watch over the greater flock. Who are taking part in the temptations with Christ. Who will remain being empowered with the understanding that he will make known to him while he's here, while he serves them. And who will be the ones at true Acts 2.0 to receive the anointing from the Holy Ghost to go out from Jerusalem and bam, Syria attacks and destroys Jerusalem at the Feast of Trumpets. I believe true Feast of Trumpets 2024. Because why? Because true Pentecost is the true 29th of Elul every year. So this is what it says. First Peter 1 Peter 1.5 who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Ready to be revealed what? In the ends of days? In the, in the final place of time? In the end of days? Right? In the end of days? It's awesome. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be. Oh, how about that? <laughs> well, I must say that was quite fitting. That's how I opened. I didn't realize that was in it. But talk about a perfect picture. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness. Through many fold temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. What appearing is this? This is the appearing only found in Revelation, in the book of Revelation. It's only found in chapter one, connected to the appearing as the typology of the beginning of his 40 days. Remember, Who's he appearing to? <coughs> or maybe even the start of the 50 days, right? Right before the pre-trip. It's a group that's going to be revealed in the end of days who were pre-watchers, who were already watchers. They were watchers in advance, it said. That's what we keep saying. In advance, a group of watchmen chosen in advance. Uh, that, you're, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold, that the appearing of Christ, okay, connected to, again, like I was just saying, either the beginning of the 50 right before the escape or when he comes after the wedding. Whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, listen to this, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. How can anybody have the end of their faith? Do you guys know there's only one way to have the end of your faith? Is if you were in the presence of Christ. I mean, literally in the presence of Christ. You see, faith comes through hearing. There, there's no hope if you've witnessed your hope. That's what scriptures tell us. So how are you going to have an end of faith, even salvation of your souls, yet still be alive? Nobody's guaranteed that, except for a group that will be in his presence. For which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched di diligently. Is there a prophetic typology or an is typology to these events? Sure. But really, this is, this is a prophetic one. 
How do you know? It told you in the last time, in the end of days. It was prophecy. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Unto who? Just anybody in the is? Sure. But really, when you're reading First Peter in the is, like churches would teach it, and how to live and to, to be in faith and having received the end of your faith, that was really more the typology. The actual thing being talked about here is the end of days. Of a group who was protected as being watchmen in advance, chosen to remain, that the prophets were diligently seeking to understand that is being revealed to a group who were watchers in advance prepared for the end of days. I don't know how many ways I could peel this onion, man. <laughs> it's craziness. It's so awesome. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. You see, in who? In the prophets. See? Search, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. That's what we've been doing. It's the revelation of the open books and the prophets. It's, it's, it's the connection to the teacher of righteousness as we've shared. It's, it, it, yeah, it's so awesome. Did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. You see, these are two different things. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. So that, so this, it's the prophets. So it's within the prophets that did signify in the prophets. These, the prophets who were given these revelations were themselves knowing that there was an end time prophetic revelation within them for the end of days for a group of people that would be kept as watchers in advance. That would come into the searching of their prophecies to reveal deeper revelations of the end that not even they themselves understood because they even sought it diligently. But they could not understand it. They were looking for it but couldn't understand it because it wasn't their time. And then it says, when it testified beforehand, the sufferings of Christ. So there's two things. When it testified beforehand, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So you got one prophecy, prophetic for the end of days, and you got one for the is of when Christ came and it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was re revealed, <clears throat> not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Okay. And then what do we see? The acknowledgement of it being that group. Remember what it said in Luke 12? Let your loins be girded about and, and you yourselves as men that wait when they return from their, the when the Lord returns from the wedding. Here it is. Now he's confirming who this group is. First Peter 1 Peter 1.13, wherefore, gird up your loins. Gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. Remember, another thing connected to the beginning. And hope to the end. To the end. For the grace of that is to be taught is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So awesome. <laughs> so, so awesome. And so where did this connect? <clears throat> well, remember, we're, we're still talking about this piece here from the flock, the little flock that is going to go out to help bring in the big flock, right? They become, they're Jesus' the Lord's little flock. But when Jesus is gone after the 40 days and he's given them the understanding and the Holy Ghost anoints them, 
they become the the shepherds, if you will. Right? They're the they're the disciples going out to bring in the flock of the Lord. So now we go to First Peter chapter five. And in First Peter chapter five, let me make sure I'm starting in my right spot. Yeah, right near the beginning. Listen to what it says. <laughs> it's so awesome. In verse one, the elders which are among you, I exhort, uh, who am also who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight. Remember, I wanted you to remember. Remember when they were saying that uh, who's the greatest in Luke? It was this little flock of the Lord who's now going to be the ones going out and going and, and bringing in the flock of the Lord during the time of seals, the ones who he's coming for, the ones that it was all about in the house of Israel to the, the lost sheep. And what did he say to them? You're to be servants. Don't lord over the Gentiles as, as, their, as their kings and their leaders do, but be a server. Serve them as I am doing unto you. This is what's taking place. You see? Give me one second. So, got to text my, got to pick up my daughter in this crazy snowy weather. Okay, but not until I'm done the video. Okay, so what you're seeing is we saw that he's telling them to serve, not to lord over them, not to do these things, but to be a server. This is why I was accentuating that at the beginning as well, because it says right here in Second in uh, First Peter five two, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint but willingly, not by filthy lure but of a ready mind. You see. He's saying to be examples as servers. He goes on to say that in verse three, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. You see, there it is again. It's directly connected to that Luke group that we were talking about in 22, in Luke 22. He's warning them. He's foretelling them. He's preparing them that to be ready of mind. Do it willingly and with love. Don't lord it over them. Don't do it for gain, but do it to bring them into the kingdom. Know that you're protecting and bringing in the Lord's flock. It's the same connection to the same group, to a flock of people, to bring in the larger flock. Now listen to this in 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, okay? And when the chief shepherd shall appear, Ye shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. It's pretty awesome, right? That you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. Do you know who gets a crown of glory? Who's, who is the, the typology and where the crowns are? It's the end of seals, remember? Remember what Joshua, Yeshua... Uh, in Zechariah chapter 6, halfway through 10, and go to the house of Josiah, um, verse 11. Then take silver and gold and make crowns and set them on the head of Joshua. Remember, Joshua is Yeshua, right? It's the picture of Yeshua, the son of Jodek, the high priest. When Jesus comes at the end of the six years of seals, remember, he's coming as high priest and king. He's coming as the Melchizedek, the greater than Aaron. And what is he coming with? They're, they're making him crowns. When do the crowns come? End of seals. It's the exact same connection to the timing of what's being said here of when this group is getting crowns. It's awesome. It's so awesome. But what, what else did we see here? And when the chief shepherd shall appear. Well, We've proven it. We just saw it there in in Zechariah 6. You might say, well, what does that mean? Because it's in Zechariah 6. Well, in the chapters to years, right? These pictures of, of, of typologies within the verses that reveal the end of days. I mean, it even tells you in chapter 8, they're going to be rebuilding the temple now 
in chapter 8, which is a picture of the beginning of trumpets after the temple was laid in the midst of, I mean, after the foundation was laid in the midst of seals. That's why I, I did a short the other day, maybe one of my last ones, in Hebrews 11. You see the picture of Enoch, and Enoch is a picture of the bride of Christ who's going to be taken at the pre-trib escape, not tasting of death, like Enoch, and Enoch was believed to have been taken at, at Feast of Weeks. And then it says, Noah, that follows the story next, which is the picture of the 40 days after the pre-trib escape. And then it talked about Abraham and how Abraham was looking for the city of his of promise, right, of his inheritance. And in the city of his inheritance, what did it tell you in Hebrews 11? It would be a place where the foundation was laid when he would go look for it. What's it a picture of? It's a picture of the great multitude rapture coming in. And what was he looking for? He was looking for the city that had a foundation. When is the foundation laid? During seals. He wasn't looking for the temple because there's no temple built during seals. Only the foundation will be laid. And then you had Sarah. And Sarah brings uh, uh, has gives birth to Isaac. That continues in the story of Hebrews 11. What's the story of Hebrews 11? It's the picture of Isaac being born. The promise who comes feet down on the Mount of Olives. It's awesome. The pictures of these things are just so incredible. And so when we're talking about when the chief shepherd shall appear, <clears throat> let's have a quick look at this one. Render a parent. Let's go see if it's the same one. Okay. It might be repeated, but let's see if it's the same one. 5319. So the Greek word 5319 at the coming of Christ. Let's see if it's in here. I'm not saying it was. This is just off the cuff. Let me see. I would assume it's got to be in the discourses. No, Mark 16. You see, you could say even better. You see that? That word for appeared. <laughs> I knew there was something going on with this word appeared. Okay? So that word appeared. When the chief shepherd shall appear. That word for appeared, I've been just explaining to you, is the end of the sixth year of seals when he comes with heavenly Mount Zion. Seals, uh, seals the 144, the great multitude rapture will come in. And we know it's the end of Mark's gospel. It's the end of the seals time of Mark. The lost sheep who the shepherd is now coming to save. Who is he saving them from? He's saving them from the wolf. He's saving them for the false, uh, the false shepherd who came in by another way. And when is he going to come? It'll be when he appears. Well, you guys all know. I told you at the beginning, for those that are new, there's a typology in the resurrection story, in the transfiguration, and in the triumphal entry of typologies of the 40 days of the Son of Man, the mid-trib great multitude rapture, when he, or when he comes at the end of seals for the great, tri, uh, great multitude rapture, and then when he returns feet down, which is Matthew's. What's the picture of Mark? It's when he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals, at the end of the sixth seal, we just recently spoke on this and the and the long garment, right, which is directly connected to the garment in the in the group in Revelation chapter six, those who are under the altar. And it's the same word for garment in Revelation seven. <laughs> you see, so, of course, why would it be in all of the synoptic gospels? It's only found in Mark for that word appeared at the exact place where the shepherd is going to appear. And when he appears, he's appearing with that robe, which is right here in Revelation 6, 11, which is those who were given white robes during having been killed during seals. And then there they are standing before the Lord at the great multitude rapture when the alive come in and those that were given robes are standing before the Lord. So awesome. I love it when these things just keep happening on the fly like that.
just more and more and more evidence. So what else do we know about this timing with the great shepherd? Okay, this great shepherd, when he shall appear, we now know is the end of the sixth year of seals. And this worker group, the remnant worker who's going to bring in his flock is going to receive their crowns because he also is coming with crowns, which we saw from Zechariah. But what about the shepherd? Well, look at what it says in John. If we go to John chapter 10, which is what? There's year one, year two, year three. What do we know about year three? Year three is about two and a half years in when we know Antichrist gets his power to continue for 42 months. This is when he gets that power to continue. And this is the time of Mark's discourse when they're to flee to the mountains because it's the time of the mark of the beast, Antichrist gets his power, and so on and so forth. Okay? Well, look at what it says in John 10. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door unto the sheepfold, but climbs some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Who is the shepherd of the sheep? Well, we just saw. We just saw in 1 Peter 5. We know who it is. It's the Lord, of course. So he's telling you how he's going to come in. <laughs> and we know at the end of the sixth seal, everybody's like, ah, hide us, mountains and rocks fall on us. And look at what he's telling them. He's warning them. Because this is the, this is the connection in chapters to years in John chapter 10 when Antichrist is coming. What does he say? Um, verse Verse 8, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall not uh, go in or out and find pasture. Verse 10, the thief cometh not, but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you might have life and that they might have it, and that they might have it more abundantly. Okay, he's the good shepherd. Who's the one that's coming? Here it is. He that is a hireling and not the sheep, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaves the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catches them, and scatters the sheep. What scatters the sheep is this? It's the one from Mark's discourse when Antichrist gets his power, when the wolf is coming, who comes in by another way, not as the true shepherd, as Christ will be when he comes. When does he come as a shepherd? When he comes with his crowns and others that worked for him get the crowns when they served him to bring in the great multitude. That's that server group bringing in the great multitude. And, and what do we know in relation to this group bringing in the great multitude? We've showed, as I start to bring this to a close, that in Romans 16, we see it right here. We've broken it down many times. Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks. Okay, They're putting their necks on the line during tribulation. That's the picture. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Gentiles, as we've been able to prove, is the time of seals, right to the end to the great multitude rapture. So they're putting their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles, which means it's during the time of seals. We go down to the bottom. There's many other parts and pieces in here, which are really awesome. And it says in verse 25, to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and to the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation, there it is again, that same word, which is the beginning appearing to, to the workers, okay? This is that appearing beginning to the worker remnant bride that remained to stay with them, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret, which was kept secret. Since the world began. So what is it a typology of two things? It's the pre-trib that's been taken. And it's the remnant now that's been chosen that was kept secret. 
that's being revealed when the Lord reveals himself for the 40 days. You see? But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, you see, there it is again, by the scriptures of the prophets, an another connection to the, the teacher of righteousness. According to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. It's the picture of the pre-trib and the remnant worker bride being here. Sorry, give me one second. All right. <clears throat> and then I'm going to end it with this. We go to 1 Corinthians 16. And 1 Corinthians 16 is a picture now to the end of that sixth year of the of seals when the Lord's coming. It's it's about this, it's a typology. Remember, it's the collection for the saints. So it's this picture of him coming to gather the saints, to, to bring in and collect the saints, <clears throat> and a group that has been approved by letters that will bring your liberty unto Jerusalem. Meaning there is a group, another group who is the 144,000 who are going to be also the ones to help bring in the great multitude rapture. That's why they're sealed first in Revelation chapter 7 before the great multitude rapture because they're going to help the seals workers, the remnant bride seals workers, bring in the great multitude rapture because they need help. That's exactly what you see in Luke chapter 10. But let me show you where else you see it. In Mark chapter 16. Remember, the resurrection is a picture of a typology of the Lord coming at the end of the six year of seals. And listen to what it says in Mark 16, 12. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them. These are the same two in the picture of the beginning of the remnant worker bride in Luke chapter 24. So he appeared in another form unto two of them. And who are they going to? They're going to the residue, unto the residue. And they went and told it unto the residue. Okay, the ones that remained. This is the time when now the 144,000 are going to receive their anointing. But the Lord is a little bit upset with them because they didn't believe the ones who were here during seals that the time was at hand. It's a picture of the, of the seals workers going and telling the 144, this group to prepare its time. And they're like, ah, I don't think so. Something along these lines are going to take place. And so this is what you're seeing in 1 Corinthians 16, this group who's going to be added to bring in the great multitude. But I want to end with this, that it says in this picture, Paul, in this typology of a Christ, it says in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 6, and it may be that I abide, and it may be that I abide, yea, and winter with you. So he's coming at a period of time which is probably going to be connected, well, which will be connected, because if six years earlier was the beginning of tribulation, it started at the Feast of Trumpets, and the day before was the end of the 50 on the 29th of Elul being the true time of Pentecost, then that means six years later, when he's coming at this point, this is a prophetic picture of him coming at about the time of Pentecost. But it tells, what does he say? He says, and it may be that I abide, yea, and winter with you. So apparently he's coming at about the time of Pentecost, and he's going to remain with them through winter, which means till about sometime in Nisan at Passover. Okay, listen to what it says. And it may be that I abide, yea, and winter with you. Remember, there's only summer and winter in Scripture. So from fall to spring, and from spring to fall. Okay, and here's what he says, that you may bring me on my journey wheresoever I go. Isn't that exactly what we talk about at the end of Mark? What happens at the end of Mark? The Lord with them, right? The Lord with them. Now he's seated on the right hand of God, and he says, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. It's the same group from Revelation 14. And they went with the Lord wheresoever he goeth. 
It's such a beautiful picture. You have to see the intricacy of the details in these words. So if he's abiding there with winter, it means he's coming at about Pentecost and he's going to remain because Pentecost is that September, October, right? <clears throat> so it's right around the time of fall, which is winter. And <laughs> winter, yeah, we're pretty good evidence. And it goes till spring and then it's summer from the beginning of spring till fall. And listen to what it says, okay? So he's going to winter with them, which means he's going to be with them about six months and they're going to, He's going to, they're going to bring him on his journey wheresoever he goes. Verse seven, for I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. Listen to this. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. So what is he telling them? <clears throat> Let me give you a picture here on the chart, uh, on, a, on a calendar, even for this year. It doesn't matter what year. Here's true pentecost so he's telling them advance in advance i'm going to go tarry in ephesus until pentecost and when i come at pentecost i'm going to winter with you winter is going to bring you to when winter is going to bring you to nisan and the time of passover you following? This is him coming at the end of six years of seals is the typology. He's a picture of the Lord coming at the end of seals. He's going to be collecting the saints, the, the great multitude rapture. He's going to do it with a group of the 144 who will come to help bring them liberty unto Jerusalem, who are helping the two who were the Luke group, the picture of the Priscilla's and Aquila's to the end of seals because they're going to need help bringing in the great multitude rapture. And he tells them, though, when he comes, he's going to winter with them, which means he's not coming till sometime in the fall. All right. Some picture in that time frame at around the fall feasts. And what does he say? And until that time, I'm going to tarry until Pentecost. What's he saying? He's saying, I'm going to remain at this place. I'm going to tarry over here until Pentecost. And then when I come and see you, I'm going to winter with you. And then that's when these things will take place. Then it's the collection of the saints. Why? Because everything we've continuously said. This pre-trib is the Feast of Weeks pre-trib connection, Deuteronomy 16. This is the six days as the six years or six days to unleavened bread. The seventh year is the seventh day to uh, um, the, the uh, assembly to the Lord. And what is when does the actual great multitude rapture happen? It doesn't happen when they see him come at the end of the sixth, sixth year, at the end of the sixth seal. The great multitude rapture, who is also wheat, but is spring wheat, is harvested in the fall at the end of summer, in the fall, right? Or just around the fall feast, at the end of summer, which is the end of the sixth year, but... It won't be, which is, which by the way, is Pentecost is the last day of the year. And Feast of Trumpets now begins the year. And there he is tearing until Pentecost, which is six full years complete. And now when he comes at Pentecost or at Feast of Trumpets to start the seventh year, which is the day after Pentecost, what does he say? I'm going to tarry with you throughout the winter now. So now he's come. Just in the exact same time frame we've been saying forever. And he's going to tarry with them through winter. Which means what? When the great multitude rapture is brought in, it's exactly the teaching of Kadosh. You can't use winter wheat. It is brought in and harvested, but it is not observed until the second day of Passover the following year, 
does it become Yashon and usable? It's the exact same prophetic picture as we've been teaching for years in the last chapter of Romans, the last chapter of 1 Corinthians. And wouldn't you know it, look at what he says. Look who's gone. See, that's why you've got another first fruits because it's the 144. The other first fruits was the workers for seals. This is the workers for trumpets. And look at what he says who's already gone. Priscilla and Aquila salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. See, they're now saluting the group that's now working trumpets. And at the beginning of the seals portion, when Priscilla and Aquila and those in their house were working, as the picture of the remnant workers, you had the pre-trib group who was taken now made known for the obedience of faith. And how does it end? Well, of course, you guys have all heard it. I'll end it right here for the night. Second Corinthians chapter 13. Here it is. This is the third time I am coming to you. <laughs> and what does he tell them? He's telling them, he says, I told you beforehand. Okay, I told you before, and I foretell you as if I am present the second time. You see, that when I come the third time, I won't spare. Because when he comes the third time, what is it? It's the day of the wrath of the year of his vengeance. See, it's the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. And look when you go see who's all gone now. All the saints salute you. Because <laughs> because the rapture group, that first group, they're now gone. So like the first group was gone greeting, then you had the workers and they were greeting. Now you've got the great multitude gone and they're greeting. Brothers and sisters, when you're given, when you have these end time eyes that can be open to you, it is tremendous to see what reveals. I completely get it. That to some people, they come across a video like this for their first one, and they say, what on earth? How does this, what is he talking about? I get it. I 100% believe me. <laughs> I get it. But I also promise you this with all my heart. If you simply take the time to diligently seek and understand in this playlist either here on youtube or on the website the first four videos in the youtube one to watch a 22 minute video a 30 minute bible study a 30 minute bible study and then let it all come into the understanding in the two hour and 45 minute one i promise you the end of days revelation in your life and in your spirit and in your heart and in your understanding will begin to open as it never has in all of your life i promise you so with that, I love you all. God bless you. God bless your families. I pray for you every single night. I'm looking forward to meeting you all. Congratulations on all the babies and the babies to come. I love you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.